This was the plan. And we have covered all except these two, ethical issues and language. And originally the plan was that we would cover ethical issues on the 10th of September and language on the 10th of, uh, on the 11th of September. But looking at your attendance, I think I will stop today. So I'll try to cover both these uh, in today's lecture. First, ethical issues, and if we have some time, then we'll uh, cover the language. Let's go to ethical issues. Can you all see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, so the first thing is ethical issues in publication. Uh, it will be composed of two sections mainly. The first one is small one where we deal with what are the responsibility of a researcher in general terms. And then we look into some specific things related to publication. And some of the points that we will cover are plagiarism, redundant publication, duplicate publication, data fabrication, falsification, authorship dispute, conflict of interest. As a researcher, we have some ethical responsibility. First of all, we must be intellectually honest. And in many cases, we will borrow the ideas of others. And when we do that, we have to give proper credit them. We cannot claim that this is our idea. So we cannot, uh, in principle, steal the idea of others without assigning the credit to them. And once you publish a couple of papers, then you will receive invitation to do the review of the manuscript of others. And when you get this kind of invitation, then you have to be fair. So you do not give your opinion based on prejudice. It is based on just the academic or scientific quality. And when we interact with other scientists, we must do it in a collegiate manner, which means that we must be doing it in a friendly way. We do not hurt anybody even though we may disagree with others, but we put it in a civilized way. If we have any conflict of interest, and I will explain that later on, then we have to declare this very clearly. And in our experiment, if it has any subject human subject or animal subjects, live subjects, then the preservation of life will be critically important. So we have to stop the tests if necessary when the protection of human being or animal are compromised. Before I proceed into the specifics of ethics of publication, I have one proposal for you. So obviously you have seen that as a scientist, we would like to publish as many as possible. That is important for us. Otherwise, if we don't publish, we perish as a researcher. So we must publish and flourish. So this is a competition sometimes. 
And in that competition, if somebody, one of your friends proposes that you publish a paper and you put his name as co-author and he or she publishes another paper and then in turn, he or she put you as a co-author. And of course, without any contribution from each other, from you or from your friend. So this is a simple way, very easy way to double your number of papers. If you do it with three persons, you triple your number of papers. So my question to you, that is it ethical? Uh, but wait, think about it, and we will get back to this. The first thing that we will consider in uh, ethical issues in publication is plagiarism. Plagiarism is basically taking that idea from others without acknowledging that this is their idea, passing it as if it is our own idea. So it's a very easy work. You can do it in the comfort of your home. Uh, however, it's the same in its gravity. It's the same as stealing money from a bank, but you have much less risk. Nobody will catch you. So in that sense, it's even worse type of crime. And we are not allowed to do that. So the definition of plagiarism is that we take the work of another and in a way we copy a figure, a table or some words from published or unpublished paper written by others and without attribution. We don't mention that we borrowed it. So this is something that is considered to be one of the heinous crime in academia. And it's easy to avoid them. So first of all, you have to cite the paper from which you borrowed. If necessary, you have to get the copyright permission if you want to uh, include that in your paper. And when you get the idea from others, you do not copy and paste. You have to write in your own way and also give reference. So that is the way we avoid them. Let me give you some more ideas. So to avoid this plagiarism, we have three options. So first of all, we use direct quotation. So you write down what others have said within the quotation, and then you give the name of the person. And in science, we usually don't have this practice. This practice is quite common in non-science disciplines like social sciences and others. What we do in science is we paraphrase what others have written and then write it in our own way. Of course, we have to give the reference. Or if it is a bigger paragraph, then we summarize them and write the summary in our own style and then we give the reference. So whether you paraphrase it, put it under quotation or summarize it or give the image or ideas or the facts, you must cite them, you must refer to them. So that is the sure way to avoid this crime of plagiarism. Now, paraphrasing is quite common in scientific writing. And let's see how we can do the paraphrasing. When we paraphrase, we rewrite it basically in our own words. And when we do that, it must have a certain quality, which means that it must accurately reflect 
the meaning of the original writing. So that is the first thing. Second thing is you do it in such a way that you change the writing style, wordings, etc., of the original source. There are a few ways it can be done and these tips will probably be helpful for the beginners. So the first step is that when you want to paraphrase a certain topic, certain areas, you read them very carefully. And then you identify the central concept in that paragraph. If there are multiple concepts, then you look at the relationship between different concepts. So you need to comprehend this. And then you think about inverting the structure of the central concepts. So if you have two concepts, C1 and C2, for instance, are written in this sequence. So perhaps you can think of writing the sentence in such a way that C2 comes first and then C1 comes later. So when you write this without losing the meaning, you still convey the message, but you write it in your own way. So that is the idea. And here are the possible steps to implement this paraphrasing in an efficient way. So you look at the original source and identify what are the verbs they used. Then don't use the same verbs, find synonyms for those verbs. You replace those verbs with new verbs that expresses the same meaning. Similarly, you look for nouns and then use similar nouns. But you have to be careful if the noun carries any technical meaning then you may not necessarily change that noun. So technical nouns should be there, but others, other nouns, I think you can use synonyms for that. You can also exercise this kind of things. You look at the grammatical units. So what are the subjects, what are the verbs? And then you break them down into those basic units so that you can rewrite them. You can rewrite them in different ways. You can change the syntax. You can change from first person to third person. So there are many, many ways you can do this kind of rewriting. You can order or reorder the phrases, the clauses. But of course, while you do that, you have to pay attention that the relationship, original relationship remains intact. Another easy way to do that is if in the original text there was a long sentence, then you just break them down into smaller sentences. Then that is also an easy way to paraphrase. So once you have done this paraphrasing, then you have to check for the accuracy. So you read carefully to see if these are accurate and completely reflects the original message. And see, if you have sufficiently changed the language and the sentences, but of course the meaning must not be changed. Nowadays, you can check for the similarity of your writer compared with all those which are already published and turn it in in a software. And I'm not sure what software we have in Boet, so probably we have to look into and anybody knows about this, what software? Do we have this Turnitin software available in our library? Any idea? Raisa, do you have any idea? If not, you, you can. Is Turnitin as available? It's quite popular. Anyway. So the next type of problem that can arise in publication is what we call redundant publication. The definition of this redundant publication is that 
we used text or data from another paper which was already published. It could be our own paper. So we take the text, we take the data, figures, tables from one of our previous publication. This is also called self-plagiarism or auto-plagiarism. And this is also bad in the same sense. To avoid this, it's easy. So what we have to do, never include material from a previous paper. So if you stick to that principle, then you will not commit any such uh, ethical uh, issues like redundant publication. Now, just to explore this further, I have some examples. So when you compile a paper, you usually go and present it to some conference. And sometimes the conference doesn't publish the whole paper, they would publish the abstract. But then you come back, you get some idea from the audience, you talk with your supervisor and other friends, and then you've got more ideas. You want to make the paper complete now. You want to publish it in a peer reviewed journal. So the question is, if you do that, you first present and then publish it, is it a redundant publication? What do you think? Any response? Does it constitute a redundant publication? Why is everybody silent? Is it difficult to answer? Let me ask you this question. Who is present today? We have a few people. Maybe I ask Rashidul. Rashidul, what do you think? Are you there, Rashid? Rashid? Yes, sir. So what do you think? And did you, did you get my question? That is the first thing. No, sir. Uh, no. Let if me... you please repeat the question. Oh, OK, I will repeat it. Thank you. So let's say you have done some tests. Your supervisor asked you to write a paper and present it in a conference and you write the paper and you go and present it in a conference. In a conference, sometimes they publish the abstract. So it was published in the conference book. Then once you come back, your supervisor asks you to enhance and enrich the paper and then send it to a journal for peer reviewed publication. Uh, do, do you understand this situation? Yes, sir. Now, my question is, will it be a redundant publication? Mm. What do you think? It depends on the weightage of the data. So if the conference data weightage is, uh, is marginal, but the total work is uh, very much larger than the conference data, then it should be, uh, it may be a, Mm, maybe a, a good to publish uh, without act like written data. Okay, you, you are close to current answer. In fact, when we go to a conference, normally we don't sign any copyright form. Copyright means you give the right, commercial right to a publisher. So for conference, we usually don't do that. And also in conference, they do not do much peer review. It's just to present the first idea. 
So whatever you present in the conference, you can still publish them. It doesn't constitute a redundant publication. So that is the thing. So all of you should be should feel encouraged to go and present your paper in the conference, and then later on you present the enhanced version, uh, publish the enhanced version. So that shouldn't be a big problem. However, there are some conferences where they will ask you to sign the copyright transfer form. So in that case, you have to be used fair, careful and talk with your supervisor. But still, I, I think you can publish. The second one, you have the same data and you write a paper. So it's, it's exactly the same data. You write a paper and you publish in journal one. And then the same paper, you just modify here and there a little bit. You publish it in another journal, journal two. Will it be a redundant publication? Who I can ask now? Because you tend to be shy. How about Aliful Islam? What do you think? If you don't understand my question, I can repeat. Aliful? Aliful Islam, are you there? Yes, sir. What do you think? Is my question clear? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so give me your opinion then. Same data, you go and publish to two different journals. So it is not acceptable. Uh, same data, another paper. Same data, you publish in two journals in slightly different form. Will it be a redundant publication? Is it ethical? Is it allowed? So that is my question. Uh, so it is not ethical. Uh, Aliful, I, I think I have a problem in listening to you. Some of you, did, did you hear what Aliful say? Aliful, can you try again? Yes, sir. It is not ethical, sir. It is not ethical. Okay, yeah. Yes, it is true. It's not ethical, really. It's redundant publication. Yes, no uh, confusion there. Another one, data on website. I think I, I will not go into those days. Depends. Another one, expansion of published data set. So that means, so you published a paper, you include some data and then you use the same data and then you make some addition there. And then you published it in another journal. Then what do you think, Alipur, this time? So can you repeat, please? Okay, so the first thing is this. You gather some data and then you write a paper you publish it in one journal, J1. And then after a few months, you get use the same data. So this is the data. And in the meantime, you conducted some additional experiments. So you add them together. And then you use everything. Now you publish it in another journal, journal two. So my question is, is it redundant publication? Sir, it is acceptable since I have done. <laughs> so it is acceptable to you. And uh, is there any other opinion? Any other? Sharia, what do you think? Sharia, are, are you there? Can you hear me? Who is that? I saw somebody. I still see Sharia. Is your device okay? Can you hear us? Assalamu alaikum, sir. Welcome, I can sir. hear you, sir. Okay, so what do you think? The problem that I just presented. 
Do you think it is a redundant publication? So for uh, last few minutes, I was not present here, sir. But no. I didn't hear the problem. Uh, anybody else who can do that? So let me see. Who was present? Raisa was present, definitely. Raisa, what do you think? Okay. Uh, sir, uh, it uh, won't be a redundant application. So you agree with Alifun? Basically. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. But actually, this is also redundant publication. We are not allowed to do that. Once something is published, republish them. Unless you publish a review paper, you cannot publish, use the same data in another research paper. This is not acceptable. So there are many other ways I think I will not go into detail. Now, we have covered plagiarism. We have covered redundant publication. So redundant publication means you never publish something that you already published. So that is, if you follow this principle, then you will not fall into this kind of problem. The next one is duplicate publication. So this is how the duplicate publication is defined. You submit, you write one manuscript, and then what you do is you send this manuscript simultaneously at the same time to different journals, journal one, journal two, journal three. You are in sir, I have a question. Yes. Um, sir, if I... Um work if i write a journal and then uh, after a time certain time i thought uh, think and then i realized that i can extend it and then i again uh, um, uh, just i copy my own table and add some some data and find some different type of um, uh, different type of um, objective or a different type of uh, uh, certain uh, um, what to say uh, I, I, I think I, I results think. results right. exactly results some right, different sir. type of results then is it is it also a redundant uh, publication uh, normally the thing is yes it is considered as redundant. There is a reason for this, because when you publish this amount of data in journal J1, you have to sign a copyright form. That means you transfer your copyright uh, ownership to the publisher. Now the publisher owns the data, you don't own the data. So if you use the same data in another paper without the permission of this, then he may sue you in court because this data do not belong to you. So that is the typical arrangement. Even but, if, but if it's uh, mine. It is not yours anymore. So normally there are two ways to publish uh, two types of journals one type of journal their authors do not pay authors do not pay any money publisher bears the expenses and they own the data you have to transfer your copyright through some legal document you have to sign so publisher is the owner you are not, this data do not belong to you legally. So this has to be very clear. However, there are other types of publication which are called open publication, open. There you publish something as an author and you pay. So you have to make the payment. You have to send the money and you own the authorship. 
not the publisher because you published, you make, gave the money to the publisher to publish it. Even if it is the case, you are not allowed to republish the same data. It is not considered to be as a good practice. Some people do, but strictly speaking, it is a bad practice. So that is the main point here. Now, you may argue that uh, originally I published this, then I got a very big discovery when I add something else, then it changed the whole situation. So if that is the case, then you have to justify this. And then for this part of your earlier data, you have to give proper reference. You cannot assume that this belongs to you. You have to give the reference to this earlier paper and make it clear that it was published already and then you are re-evaluating the data together with some new data. So those kind of things have to be very, very clear. Now, in order to avoid this kind of issue, so at the beginning, the advice to the student is that never do this kind of extension. Once you publish, forget about it, and then use your known, own new data and then publish another paper. Why go to those kind of trouble? Is it, is it convincing to you, Raisa? Uh, sir, yes, sir. But uh, sometimes uh, some people say that uh, I continue my uh, undergrad no. thesis. Uh, and no, thesis then, is another. Thesis is not published. You can write your paper out of your thesis. No problem. But they publish it. Yes, you can publish from your thesis. Maybe I'll discuss it another day, perhaps. So once you write it in your thesis, then it is an unpublished work. So you have every right to take out some of the material and publish it as a paper. So that is not an issue. But once you publish it in a journal, then you have to be careful. Okay, okay sir. Okay. So as for duplicate publication, as, as I mentioned, so you have the same paper you send to three journals simultaneously. And you are lucky, you see that there are two journals who published your paper at the same time. And this is called duplicate publication. And this is considered to be very unethical in science. You cannot publish thing in two journals. In order to avoid that, one and wait until it is checked. in formal manner, telling that you cannot wait any longer. You are checking out your paper and you will submit it elsewhere. So you have to write it in a very clear way. So this is duplicate publication. Any question so far? Let's go to the next part data fabrication, falsification. This is, you obtain certain data by using, uh, from an experiment, then you change the data or you make up the data. So God forbid, this is a very, very serious crime. So we never do that. And sometimes we have an impulse that we got certain data, but it doesn't look good. So we try to improve them and we modify the data. So that is also forbidden. In some cases, we tend to use digital manipulation to make an image look better. So that is also data fabrication or falsification, a serious crime. 
to avoid that, any data that you have, you must present it exactly as you found it. Don't doctor any data. Don't withhold any data that doesn't support your hypothesis. So you have to put the complete data. As for the images, don't try to beautify them, particularly using this kind of software where you can make things look very different. Sometimes you can do some digital uh, improvement, but then you have to apply to the whole image. Because we have these digital images, you can increase the contrast or lower the contrast, increase the brightness as a whole for the whole photograph that is allowed to some extent. But if you have a photograph with different specific features, you cannot change a specific feature. I'll show you some example, but before that, just look at what this improper editing means. For instance, you should not move or remove or introduce or hide or enhance any feature, specific feature within an image. If you do that, it is considered as manipulation. And here is one famous example. So this paper was published, was sent to the editorial office for publication. And this paper was accepted in fact. Later on, it was discovered that in the digital images that were sent, there appears to be some boxes. And when these boxes were removed, then they found that there were some spots. And the conclusion of the paper were based on the fact that there were no spots, which means that this is a serious manipulation. So later on, I think that paper was withdrawn. So this kind of thing uh, considered to be a very, very bad thing in academia. The next one is authorship dispute. So you carry out your work. Sometimes others will help you. Your supervisor is involved. Another professor or another fellow student may be involved in the work that you are doing. Now, who are eligible to be the co-authors in your paper? You have to have a clear idea about this. And we must do everything this authorship dispute. The definition of authorship dispute is that it arises when we add authors, we take out the name of the authors, we change the order of the authors. So these kind of things will constitute authorship dispute. To, all, to avoid that, we have to discuss these things even before we write the paper, talk with your supervisor. And even before the study, in fact, that is possible and then agree upon who should be the authors, what should be the order in which the name of the authors will be placed. And we must ensure that all authors meet the criteria for the authorship. And there are very clear criteria for authorship. So authors must have made substantial intellectual contribution, must have participated sufficiently to take the responsibility of the content and can defend the data and conclusion publicly if somebody uh, raises some doubt about the work. Now let me explain it in more clear terms. So COPE is an organization which stands for Committee for Ethical, sorry, Ethical uh, Committee uh, for 
ethical publication. So basically it's a committee that deals with ethical publication. It's an international body and it sets the criteria based on some of its member associations. So this is a criteria that is universally followed. Originally, uh, I think, put forward by this International Committee for Medical Journal or something. So there are four aspects of it. Number one, a person, if he or she wants to be included as a co-author, he or she must have made substantial contribution to any one of these three. One, in the concept and design of the work, so must have been involved right from the beginning. Or in the acquisition of data while it was being carried out. Or in the analysis or interpretation of data. So any one of them will do. And number two, drafting the article or revising the article critically for intellectual content, not just grammar and English correction for intellectual content. So this is and. Then the third one, he or she must have the confidence to competence to give the final approval for you to publish. And if any controversy arises out of it, he or she should be agreeable to be accountable and to defend the work in public, to show the integrity of his authorship. So if the person does not satisfy all these four criteria, then he or she will not be considered to be co-author. So that is the international rule for being co-authorship. Now, if I give you a quiz as this, so let's say we consider your supervisor is involved in the concept and design of the paper. He doesn't have time to go to the lab and assist you. You do everything. He may assist you in some way to do the interpretation. He doesn't have time to write the first draft, but he will look at it critically. And then improve the manuscript. He has a expertise to give you the final approval. He's also willing to take the responsibility if anything goes wrong in the paper. So if that is the case, then what do you feel about your supervisor? Is he eligible to be a co-author? Does he meet all four criteria? What is your opinion? Is my question unclear? Of course, I have to go and find you. So who should I ask today? Salman, what do you think? Uh, First, did you get my question? Salman, are you there? Salman, yes, sir. did you get my question? No, sir.
How about others? I see some new names there. Merazul Haq. I see the name Merazul Haq. Muhammad Merazul Haq. What do you think? Uh, uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, due to load shedding, I cannot connect with you from the beginning. Um, extremely sorry for that. Okay. All right. Uh, so who has the intention to answer me? Again, I have to go back to Rashid or Raisa, who has been following this for the last few days. What do you think, Rashid? Yes, uh, the supervisor, he or she is uh, perfectly eligible for the co-authorship. Okay, because the, in the, the situation that I described, so the supervisor obviously uh, meet all the criteria, all four criteria. So there is no issue there. Uh, what happened? Okay. So if there are somebody who helped you in some way in your communication, uh, so those will be people who did not meet all four criteria. Maybe they met one criteria or acknowledgement towards the end of the paper, contribute, telling what contribution they made, but they are not supposed to be your co-authors. And these are the examples when the authorship is not uh, ethical, just for one activity, like acquisition of funding, somebody gave you the fund to carry out the research in the lab. So you cannot give them the authorship just for giving the funding or somebody who is collecting the data in the lab. He or she doesn't participate in any kind of interpretation or designing of the experiment and so on. Then you can acknowledge them, but they will not be your co-authors. Somebody helped you in writing, in correcting the English, that is also not enough to be a co-author. Somebody did the editing, language of technical editing, proofreading, so they are not supposed to be co-authors. I think that's all for this, except that we have this conflict of interest. And for conflict of interest, I'll just give you one example and then end it here. So for instance, that uh, you are working on a project where the company is giving you some fund or giving your supervisor some fund. And you are working on the product of the company. And your data is collected on the products produced by that company. Now, if this is the case, then this is a clear conflict of interest. And you have to declare this. Towards the end of the paper, you have to declare this conflict of interest saying that your work received fundings for research from that company and the sample was collected from that company. And it must be made very clear so that the audience can judge themselves if they want to believe you or not. So you have to make this kind of Con conflict of interest public. Okay, now I come back to my original question. So those of you who have been with us, well, I asked you this question that somebody, some of your friends, so you make a ring, a group of friends, you scratch the back of each other, so you give the names of each other in your papers. So if you have three, which means that at the end of year one, all of you published one paper, but in fact, you have three papers because you gave the names, but of course, without any contribution. So the criteria is that there has to be four types of contribution that we just described. 
So in such a case, what is your opinion? Is it ethical? No, sir, it's not ethical. So it's not ethical. So we have to be very careful about this. So I think we have done uh, the whole thing. We have first looked at the responsibility uh, as an ethical researcher. And we have seen that we have to behave in a certain manner. We describe how we should do. And then we have looked at some specific way how ethical issues can be encountered in publication. So one of them is plagiarism, which is that we take out the ideas and data and text from others without acknowledging them. In order to avoid that, we have to paraphrase and then we have to cite. Then we have redundant publication, where we take out some data which we have published already. We cannot do that. Even if it is our own work, then we have to cite the previous publication. Duplicate publication, which means that we send the publication to two different, three different journals. And then incidentally, two of the journals publish them at the same time. So this is also considered to be a very bad practice. To avoid that practice, we cannot send one manuscript simultaneously to more than one journal. So we have to do it one after another. We send it to one journal. If they do not accept it, if they reject it, only then can we send to another journal. We have to avoid all kind of data for fabrication. We cannot invent the data. We use the data as we collect it in the lab. <clears throat> we cannot doctor our, uh, our micrographs, our figures. We have to avoid authorship dispute. We know exactly what are the criteria for authorship there are four. And if somebody doesn't meet all four criteria, they cannot be co-authors. If someone meets one criteria or two or three, all of them do not meet the authorship dispute, strictly speaking. And your supervisor meets all four criteria. In fact, if he supervises you properly. So in that case, there is no issue with your supervisor. Then we have conflict of interest. If there is any conflict of interest, we have to declare this uh, publicly. So I showed you this before. Just listening to me is not enough. Then you are learning, but what helps you is that you apply it. So that is the thing. You must. So with this last slide, I think I'm done. And as for the English, since I promised that I'll cover some English, and let me just quickly show you some slides. And we'll try to give you the main message. So the main message that I want to give you as for language is that language is extremely important for you. And you probably notice that, uh, or you will notice later on, that people who have this capability to communicate in writing, in a verbal communication, they tend to get better positions. And in their career, they tend to be more successful. So as a young scientist, a re, uh, engineer, or a young professional, if you feel that your language skill is not enough, then you must do something while you are studying. Because otherwise it will be difficult for you to improve yourself. Now that something is 
that you take extra course, you recognize first that you lack this capability, then you take extra course. There are many courses available, many uh, uh, sort of kind of help available on the internet. Some of them are free. And also there are many professional courses available like the British Council, they have this uh, business English or something. So you have to improve your skills. And there is no alternative to this. And on the internet, there are free sources. For instance, in MIT, they will have one website for technical writing. And you can download their handbook. It's very uh, well written and it's very useful. You can consult them whenever you want. Okay, so what I will emphasize is that making the first draft is only the first step. Your writing involves a lot of rewriting. So you have to read and read again and read. So the first thing is that organizing your material. I think we discussed it uh, to some extent earlier. You first have to assemble all the material, make outline, prepare the graphics and table, and then you think about writing the first draft. And after you write the first draft, then you have to revise this. And this is not correcting the grammatical error. You look at it from different angles and see the format, see the organization, see the content, so that bigger things in your writing, the bigger mechanics, you have to look at it. And it's not just once, you may have to do it three, four, five, six times, even more, you have to look at it. And then you look at the sentences and words, make it them concise, make it them clear and coherent. Your choice of words, your style of sentences must be easy for others to follow. Then you let it read by others, give it to your friends so that he or she can give their opinion on the write-up that you just prepared. Give it to your supervisor, of course, towards the end. So you may be doing a very good work, but if your language is not good, it can decrease the possibility of it being accepted. So please pay attention. And I show you one complaint from a frustrated editor. And this is a real life example. So this paper fell well below my threshold. I refuse to spend time trying to understand what the author is trying to say. And look at the language. So you cannot send, you cannot submit garbage to us. So just think about it. If the editor is so unhappy about your English, then you can guess what will be his decision. So my rule of thumb is, if there are more than six grammatical errors in the abstract, then, then I don't waste my time carefully reading the rest. So I think you got the message. So a scientific paper has to be clear, objective. It doesn't have any extra material, it's to the point. And it is written in a logical way, in a linear manner. It's not complex, it should be simple. And you have to understand the difficulty of the reader. So you have to write it in such a way that this is easy for others. It should be as short as possible. Take out all unnecessary material. Let me give you, and always remember, there are two aspects of the writing. One aspect is from your side, from the author's side. And another aspect is from the reader's side. So you have to write in such a way that you consider adequately the perspective of the reader. 
Only then can you become a successful writer. And typical uh, small things that you can utilize to make it easy. The first of all, all sentences must be short. You should not write long sentences because long sentences have higher risk of containing grammatical errors. So if you follow this simple rule, then your writing will be improving. And normally the length of the sentence should be about 12 to 17 words, let's say less than 20 words. If during your first draft writing, you, if you write long sentences, then during revision, during review, you break those sentences down. If you find them, find that they are having more than 20 words. Okay. And here is one example containing 80 words, and I, I'm sure you will not like it. This is another one, 91 words. So it's very difficult to understand. Anyway, I, I think uh, it's about time that I finish it. Let me go through this. The same about paragraph. Don't write long paragraphs. So typical suggestion is this, a paragraph should contain less than about 125 words. And in one paragraph, you can introduce just one thought. You cannot have more than one thought in one paragraph. Then it's difficult for reader to understand it. And the flow of the writing, it should be like a storytelling. So there should be a clue from one point to another. It should flow easily so that the author, the reader, once it, he can easily follow and goes towards the end and understand the conclusion. And in the meanwhile, from one paragraph to another, the transition should be smooth between sections. I think I will stop. So I guess I have done my job. Let me just get on to this. Of this. We want to get rid of this. And then show you one more, one last slide. That is my intention. Laptop is not. Okay, so let me go back to the content. So if I look at the schedule, I have covered all my contents today, up to up till now. So all the contents are covered. I didn't uh, touch too much on the language, but I gave you some essential ideas. That means I have nothing to tell you on the 11th of September. So you get free time, but please do come back on the 12th of September at 3 p.m. because we have our teachers who will come and spare some time and then give you some uh, good advice how they tackle and write good papers in different journals and submit them and also publish them in different journals. 
So there are a lot of experience uh, that we will share on that day. So anything Anything that you want to ask me, or ask about the next program. So maybe our co-host, uh, Raisa and Rashid, do you have any suggestion? Anything to announce? No, sir. No. All right, so uh, we will see you, I think, in that case. So thank you very much.